Now, here's, here's, here's the next question. What is a fast? A fast or fasting is abstaining from food to focus our minds and bodies on a spiritual cause. That's the definition of what a fast is. And if you want to Google a different definition, it'll take you pretty much the same message. It's just abstaining from food so that you can have or focus your body and your mind on a spiritual cause, spiritual cause. And one of the most famous passages on fasting in the Bible is um, found in one of the prophets. And we're going to read that today. And we're just going to take one part of it. And then you can read the rest of it at home. Uh, we're going to take one part of it so that we can get into one of the main points that I wanted to address tonight. And we're going to start by reading Isaiah 58, verses 3 to 4. And it says this. We have fasted before you, people say, the church says. So why aren't you impressed, God? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. Hmm. I will tell you why I respond. This is God responding. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Wow. So God is trying to tell us that before we enter this fast, you got to be careful with the motive that you enter this fast in. Because here's my next point. There are wrong motives to fasting. And the first wrong motive that you can ever have is lose weight. Just let it sink in. I'll give you another minute. <laughs> Some people really, really fast, honestly, and you're starting to think about, how many pounds am I going to be down? <laughs> By the end of 21 days, how much thinner am I going to be? Ooh, I can wear those jeans that I have not worn in such a while. <laughs> and then you start YouTubing how much weight you can lose in 21 days. And then you start seeing all the videos and the before and after pictures of a 21-day fast. But you're focused on the wrong thing. And, and, and that's, just, <laughs> that's just so vain, guys. That's almost as bad as, or just, just, it's almost as bad as you doing the electrical slide when you see the cameras coming to you when you're in worship. <laughs> hey, man, Jesus. It's bad. You're doing it because you want people to see you or you want to do it for a vain reason. And that's just not what God is looking for when you're fasting. Not a good motive. Here's a wrong motive, another wrong motive. To get God on your will. That's a, that's a wrong motive for you to fast. You don't want to get God on your will. Because I want to tell you something. Starving yourself to get God to do something for you is not fast. That's called a hunger strike. You, you don't want to use your fast as a means to get God to do something for you. Another one is this, to prove your spirituality. That's a wrong motive, to prove your spirituality. Fasting to feel more spiritual comes from a spirit of self-righteousness. God doesn't like self-righteousness. And sometimes we're fasting so that we can feel super spiritual. And God is up in heaven saying, uh-uh, that's not right. Some people fast in order to prove their spirituality and impress others. But Jesus is saying, that's a waste of time. He actually spoke about it in Matthew chapter 6. And he said, and when you fast, can you say when? when? Not if. Yep. Not if you fast. Yeah. This is New Testament. If you don't believe in the practice of fasting, here's Jesus trying to tell you. It's still going on. Yeah. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. See, Jesus was a savage too, man. This guy wasn't playing around. Like he's, he's speaking the same way sometimes that I try to be like Jesus. As the hypocrites do. <clears throat> For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they will ever get. If you fast in a way so that people can be like, that was your reward. That was it. And I mean, for some of you, that will do. But you're missing out so much on what God can do through the fast in your life. Come on. And it's simply because you have the wrong motive. God doesn't really bless external obedience only. God wants to bless internal obedience. And here's an internal obedience point in your life as you enter this 21-day fast. You can't fast with the motive of trying to impress people. And some of you will be tempted 
not to speak about your fast, but to be a more spiritual minister of God. (laughs) And you will walk differently. And you will possibly experience God's presence in private. And you will possibly experience supernatural things during your 21-day fast. But unfortunately, sometimes God holds back from allowing you to experience supernatural things because he knows that you experiencing those supernatural things will make you walk with a swagger that is not for you. Because you feel so spiritual. The authority of God is on me. Nah, bro. (laughs) There were two brothers that thought that Jesus' authority was on them. And they ended up, and they were trying to cast the demon out. And because they had this swag that God was just not, mm -mm, he's like, I'm not backing that up. Because if I back that up, I'm going to harm them more. And the demon spoke back to these two siblings and said, Jesus, we know of. Paul, we know of. But who the hell are you? (laughs) And the two, these two, these two dudes, these two siblings trying to be all authoritative and spiritual. And they had a spiritual high. They had the wrong motive in all their fasting, all their scripture reading. Yeah. The demon-possessed person um, got possessed by the demon, and the demon beat them up through the demon-possessed person and stripped them naked, and they ran naked, embarrassed and humiliated. Mm. This is what happens when we, when, when we walk in a, in, 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 in a style that God is like, that, no, nah, man, that's, that, that, that's, that's not what I'm calling. The, the, the greatest of you shall serve the smallest. Yeah. You want to be great? Be the least. And I'm saying this not in a way where what you say is what determines this. Because some of you are very quiet about it, but your heart, mm, my God, you are prideful. And you feel superior. If you go to Bible college, please tone that down. A lot of people that enter seminary, Bible college, they walk around like thinking like they're a walking Bible. No, you're not. <laughs> God wants us to have a posture of humility. That's good. And if you're fasting with the wrong motive to impress people, God can't move through you. And he will hold back from giving you some of the experiences that you so wish, desire to have with them because he opposes the proud. And here's the last one. Here's a wrong motive, to receive God's approval. Some of you might think that if I fast, God will love me. No. If I fast, God will like me more. Nope. If I fast, then God will approve of me. Nope. He already approved. He already loves you. He already likes you. Because once again, let's go back to grace. Let's go back to grace. This, this is not based on your efforts. This is based on grace. Right. It's never going to be about what you do. It's always about what Jesus did. Come on. Every fast, there's one key that is very important to it. Because the Bible talks about spiritual keys or spiritual laws that are very important. Let's look at some of the list or some of the things that are spiritual laws that are a blessing. Here's one of them. If we worship with thanksgiving in the middle of a problem, God will intervene. This is a spiritual law. Another law is if I tithe and give God 10% of my income, God blesses and multiplies the 90 and he blesses it. That's a spiritual law. Another spiritual law that God speaks about is this. The law of sowing and reaping. What I sow is what I'll reap. Now let me give you an example, okay? If a father doesn't spend time with their kids or a mother doesn't spend time with her kids and then the kids grow up, get married and have their children, now that father or that mother became a grandparent. Yes? If the grandchildren don't spend time with granddad or grandma and grandpa and granddad freak out and go, I can't believe that my grandchildren are not close to me. Why aren't my grandchildren close to me? Why doesn't my son or why doesn't my daughter bring my grandchildren close to me? Well, what did you plant? Because if you were absent, the majority of your son's life, of your uh, daughter's life, you reaped something. 
Because you sowed something. It's the truth with marriage as well. If your marriage is broken, it's because that's what you put into it. If I grab a box and I put $100 in the box, and when I reach into the box, guess what I'm going to take out? Because that's what I put in. There's a law. It's a spiritual law. And it's crazy because it works with Christians and non-Christians. It's the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. It's a law that happens. If I sow good, I reap good. If I sow evil, I reap evil. It's a spiritual law. There's the law that if I forgive others, God will forgive me. If I'm forgiving, I will receive forgiveness. There's another spiritual law that God talks about in his word, and that is if I'm hard on others, God will be hard on me. The rod that you use to measure people is the rod that will be used to be measured against you. It's a spiritual law. These are all spiritual laws, but the most important one is the law of prayer. Because when we pray, God literally intervenes in earth. It's powerful. God speaks that when we pray, this gives him the ability to intervene here on earth. God will not intervene in this world unless we pray because he's given us the free will to choose to pray or not. And he will not violate what he's established. And this is why God is seeking for people who do pray. And a lot of the suffering and evil that happens in this world are a result of people's will to do evil. We blame God. We can't blame God for all the bad. And then... Not think about it when something good happens. When, it's funny. When humanity is doing really well, we don't blame God on the good. When something bad happens, like a shooting happens, where was God? You took him out. The moment you stopped praying. Why isn't this city receptive to Jesus? Because you don't come to midweek and pray. A lot of the evil that happens today would be impeded if more Christians prayed. But unfortunately, God can't find Christians that pray. Now let me read it to you in the scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 says, I looked for someone. Who's this? God. I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall, but I found... God was going, I'm looking for people to come on Thursday night to Crip Church. But they keep Netflixing and chilling. Oh. Or they keep taking the shift at work when they have the option not to. Because they're stressed with all their bills. And they forget that I'm their provider. God is looking for people to come pray. Because the law of prayer is this, that if you pray, I move. This is why every revival in history starts with prayer. I don't know if I should tell you about the revival in Azusa. Have you guys heard of the Azusa Azusa revival? In 1906, a group of people started praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. This happened in 1906. It's true. And in the factory that they would pray in, a cloud would form. A real cloud. And a cloud would not disappear. And it wasn't fog, like the fog machine that we use. (laughs) I don't think they had that. This is 1906. And people from all over the world would come to Azusa, that factory where this group of people would pray and pray and pray, and a cloud started forming. And they say that people would walk in without limbs and they would walk in that cloud and limbs started growing. A revival started breaking full. Now, if you go, I don't believe in that. Well, then you don't believe in God. (laughs) The whole point of God is that he's supernatural. And he's the author of miracles. 
And if you can't believe in a God that does miracles, your God's too small. And if you only worship a God that you can understand, uh, good luck. He's as smart as you. <laughs> Not a really smart God. You, you have to worship a God that you can't understand fully. Your finite mind should not be able to understand what's infinite. <clears throat> it was amazing. Now, we researched what are the revivals that have happened here in Vancouver. Guess how many? None. In all of Vancouver's history, there has not been one revival. And so what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get people to come pray. I'm trying to get people to break off the demonic trap from hell that Satan keeps whispering that you're too busy to come pray. That's purely just a lie from the pit of hell. You're not too busy to come and pray. You're not. Because <clears throat> King Solomon was busy and he said there's time for everything under the sun. Another thing is this. If a game was playing or a movie that you really wanted to watch on a Thursday night came out, or a friend came and said, hey, we haven't hung out in a while, and you really like that friend, you would make time. Yeah. And here's what God is calling all of us to do in this season, once January 6th hits, for us to come and pray. If we want to see our city changed, if we want to see our nation changed, if we want to see neighborhoods changed, if we want to see destinies be changed, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We got to get out of the box of busyness. We got to get out of the box. I'm too lazy. We got to stand in the gap. God is looking for people. God is looking for a church. And the most beautiful miracle in our church is that the majority of it is made up of young people on fire for Jesus that come here selflessly, sacrificially, and we give God our faith, we give God our talents, we give God of our time, we send up our prayers, and God is moving. God is moving. And this is the beginning of a move because something greater is coming. There is a cloud beginning to shape. There is a cloud that is beginning to swell. Vancouver hasn't seen what God is going to do, but I know that it's going to be big. Shout amen if you believe. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 says this, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. In reference to prayer. Matthew chapter 21 verse 22, Jesus spoke about prayer and says, you can pray for anything. You can pray for anything. And if you have faith, you will receive it. I'm praying for revival. I'm praying for dark chains to fall off people. I'm praying for freedom and deliverance that keep people in bondage. I'm praying for Jesus' word and the gospel to spread. I'm praying for church campuses all over Vancouver, Surrey, White Rock, Burnaby, Richmond, Langley. I'm praying. I'm praying for a move. I'm praying for people to let go of their earthly mindset and pick up an eternal one. I'm praying for churches that can have experiences where people don't fall asleep. Amen. Somebody say amen. I'm praying for our differences to be taken care of in a mature way. Sure, we will not agree with everything all the time. That's, it's so stupid to think that we need to agree with everything in order to work together. That's just foolishness. We come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different houses, different homes, different cultures, different, different ages, different everything. How could we all agree on the same thing all the time? That's just pathetic. And if you don't know what pathetic means, it just means it's sad. I'm praying for us to be mature Christians that can talk about differences. I'm praying for that spirit of religion and religiosity and just condemnation and self-righteousness to be gone in Jesus' name. Praying for that garbage, that voice to leave my city. For those that think they're smart, for them to be humble. Be like, Chill, buddy. Yeah, sure, you can spoke, quote scripture. That's not going to change your city, bro. It's going to change your city is when we decide to commit to a vision. 
When we decide to commit to Jesus, his vision that he has sent to our church, give up of our time, give our service, give up of our sacrifices. In other words, sacrifices, fasting. Give up our comfort for fasting. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. The last church I ever want to be is one where you come and get confused the hell out. Because I gave you so much deep truth. I want to move. I want to move. I want people that, I want people to come up here and have testimonies where they go, I was bound. I was bound. I could not help myself. I was stuck in pornography. I was addicted to sex. I did crack. I did this. I was done. I was confused. I was broken. I had been cheated on. I had, ah, uh, my heart was shattered. But now, but now, but now, but God, but now, but God, but God set me free. My chains are gone. I've been set free. I was a wretched man one day, but now I'm whole. I was blind. I see. Those types of testimonies, life change, transformation from the Holy Spirit that flows from within our hearts. So shout amen. And this is why we need to pray. Because God wants to move. But he moves through prayer. And this is why the devil attacks prayer so much. Because he knows that God moves through it. And so here's the thing that we need to understand. There is no point in fasting if we don't pray. There is no point in fasting if we don't pray. The most important part of a fast is prayer. Okay, I'm going to finish this really quickly, okay? I'm going to read through it, and we might review it again next week, okay? So we're going to do 21 days of prayer with fasting. 21 days of prayer with fasting. And here's the goal for all of you that are starting when it comes to prayer. I want us to pray for 21 minutes daily for 21 days. That's going to be your start. Commit to 21 minutes of prayer every day. You can divide it. Seven minutes in the morning, seven at lunch, and seven minutes at dinner. Yeah. Here's our prayer list. Jesus said, the harvest is plenty, and it doesn't look that way, right? Look how much space we have in this building. But this building will be filled. Amen? Amen. But we got to do it the right way, and here's the right way. Jesus said, the harvest is plenty. We're like, oh, God. And he says, but the laborers are few. We, we try to bring the harvest without the laborers in here to take care of them. And God's like, I can't send you a harvest if you don't have enough hands to take care of it. So I'm going to pray for God to ignite in some of you the need to pray so that God can speak to you so that you can actually plug yourself in to be a laborer to take care of the harvest. That's the first list. Labors for the harvest. The second one is God's will for our church to prevail. We're going to fast for this. We're going to pray for this for 21 days. Third one is the hearts in our city for them to be opened. You can, you can take all this down because we're going to need to pray. So just try not to just or take a picture at the end of the list. The next one is this. We're going to pray against principalities opposing the church. There are principalities that oppose the church. And if you have no idea what that is, let me read it to you in the scriptures. Daniel chapter 10 verses 11 to 13 says this. And the man said to me, this was an angel that spoke to, to Daniel, a guy that fasted for 21 days. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. So this was very crazy. I mean, a supernatural being just appeared to him. And then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself. This is the fasting part. Before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prays. The who? To which most churches nowadays would be like, what the heck is that? A spirit prince is a principality that Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 speaks about. There are governors in every area. There are governors in every neighborhood in the unseen realm. These are spiritual beings that govern. There are governors in every city. And they're in ranks. Every city has its one governor. Every neighborhood has another governor. And they all report to the one that is in charge of the entire city. 
and they respect their territories, they respect their boundaries, they respect and they work very efficiently against that city or against that nation or against that neighborhood or against that school. Once I had an image pop into my head of a school and I can picture a huge dark being just standing on top of it with a pitchfork saying, this is my area. And this is what Daniel is talking to us about in the spiritual realm um, when he speaks about this. And he says, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia speaking about a geographical location, blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, this was backup, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of? So every geographical location has a prince. It's called the principality. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 speaks about this. So we need to fast against these principalities. Here's the next one that we need to fast against. Against rebellion, deception, and unbelief. I believe these are three strongholds or three princes that rule in our city. Rebellion, people just rebel against God. Deception, people believe lies, new age, all that type of stuff. It's deception. Um, A pluralistic view of God that you can find God with any path. That's not true. There's only one way and his name is Jesus Christ. Right, and that's it. Say that's it. That's That's it. And unbelief, people don't want to believe in God. People want to believe in everybody else except God. So we're going to fast against rebellion, deception, and unbelief. Here's another one that we're going to fast for. We're going to fast against sexual immorality. This generation is bound, our city is bound by sexual immorality. We're going to fight and we're going to fast against this in prayer. And then the last one is your personal reasons. That is the last of my list. You can take a picture of that if you need to right now. This is the list of the things that we're going to be fasting for. And against. All right. Here's the next spot. Two more, two, more, two more things that we need to talk about. Two more things very quickly. What are the ways to fast? There are three ways. A, the regular fast. This means that you abstain from all food, solid and liquid, except water. B, the partial fast. And most people know this as the diet fast. This is where you abstain from all food except for fruits and vegetables. You can eat fruits and vegetables. Please don't try to like find recipes on how to make it feel good and taste good because you're like, how do I make this more comfortable? It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. Got it? it. And then there's the full fast. It's you abstain from all food and water and you can do this for a maximum of three days. Don't go more than that unless the Holy Spirit guides you. But make sure it's the Holy Spirit guiding you and not you just being delusional. (laughs) I think I hear God. No, <laughs> that wasn't God, bro. Um, you can. I did this one, and this one's really hard. I did it once a few years back, and I, I'm not even kidding you. You actually see visions of pina colada. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like here, and I'm telling you, I saw a vision. I went to lay down on my bed. I turned off all the lights because I had a headache. I hadn't had a drop of water in three days. I thought that I could do it because I don't regularly drink water. I laid down, and I kid you not. I saw those little sun and those little cups, pink colada, and the cherry on top, and they had three of them floating in a circle. And I was like, is this a vision? Like Peter, you know, take and grab. God says it's okay. It was tough. You start seeing things. So I would recommend you to really pray about this and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to do it. All right, important instructions. Next one. Important instructions for you to understand. You can select a different fast per week. You don't have to take one fast and do the whole three weeks. You can try each one. Got it? Another one is this, the partial fast should be at least seven days. So this is the Daniel fast. Your partial fast should at least be seven days. Most people say if you're going to do the Daniel fast or the partial fast, you should go for the full 21. I'm going to say do at least seven days because some people would be like, I'm going to fast the partial fast or the Daniel fast with vegetables and fruits um, in the mornings. And then I'm going to break my fast and have dinner. <laughs> That's not a fast, bro. <laughs> That's called dieting. (laughs) So you should at least go for a full seven days, okay? And see, you can regular or full fast with one meal a day. But make sure that you have 12 hours before you break fast. And last one is D, you can fast mornings or evenings. Sometimes people think that you can only fast in the mornings. That's not true. The period, the point of fasting is to abstain from food. Whether if you do it in the mornings, it's fine. Or if you do it at nighttime in the evenings, it's also fine. Let me give you an example. If you're a construction worker and you're fasting, and you're not eating, you're going to faint. And you're going to fall three stories down. And then no one's going to catch you. <laughs> but Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll see him, right? <clears throat> so it's important for you to have breakfast if you have a physical demanding job or one that requires a lot of mental energy. Eat. Go ahead. And then start your fast at three. But... 
before you break fast, you should at least fast for 12 hours. Because if you fast, if you eat breakfast, lunch, you start your fast after work or in the afternoon around 3 p.m. and you fast all the way to 9 and then you eat, you didn't fast. That was not fast. That's just reducing the amount of food you took in. It has to be a sacrifice. Say it on three, sacrifice. One, two, three. Sacrifice. If it's not a sacrifice, it costs you nothing. Why would you want to ever give God something that costs you nothing? Okay, I'm done for tonight. Are you guys ready to go home? All right, was that good? Yes. All right, give God Jesus Christ a Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord God. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.